Okay, Dr. Gooden here, back with the third lecture for the trunk and spinal column. And in this lecture, we're going to talk about the specific muscles themselves. We've, we've given the overview, we've looked at some of the bony landmarks, as well as the movements of those joints, but what, what muscles move those joints? All right, we're going to start off with muscles of the head. Most of, hint, hint, most of these muscles have the word capitis in it. So all of these originate on the cervical vertebrae and insert on the occipital bone of the skull. There are three anterior vertebral muscles, the longus capitis, rectus capitis anterior, and rectus capitis lateralis. Note that they all have capitis in their name because they move your head. And then the other words are descriptive as well. Longus capitis is the longus. Rectus capitis anterior is on the anterior aspect, and rectus capitis lateralis is um, lateral to that. All of these flex the head and the upper cervical spine. Now, rectus capitis lateralis, because of its position laterally, um, it can laterally flex the head if it contracts unilaterally. It also assists rectus capitis anterior in stabilizing the atlanto-occipital joint. Here are some pictures of those. We have rectus capitis lateralis out here, rectus capitis anterior. So these are very small, and I don't expect you to be able to palpate these. Here's rect uh, rectus longus capitis. Sorry, not rectus, just longus capitis. And then you can see longus colli as well. Longus colli doesn't move the head, but it does do cervical flexion. You can see, you can tell because it's on the anterior aspect of the cervical spine running down along it. So if these muscles shorten, if, the, if it pulls that way, then it's going to flex the neck. Um, okay, here's another picture. Now there's a lot of muscles in here that we don't need to know. You do need to be able to palpate the hyoid bone I have a video linked in Canvas showing you how to do that. Um, be very gentle when you palpate it. You can, you can kind of jiggle it around a little bit, but be careful of the Adam's apple and your, you know, your trachea and all that important stuff. Here is the longus capitis right in there, hidden underneath the sternohyoid uh, muscle and the omohyoid muscle. All right, posteriorly, we have the rectus capitis posterior, major and minor. Okay, obliquus capitis, and obliquus, you can tell it's going to run diagonally because of that word obliquus. Um, obliquus capitis, superior and inferior, and semispinalis capitis. Now, all of these are extensors of the head, except for obliquus capitis, most likely because of that angle, right? We haven't seen it yet, but we, can, we know that it's, it goes diagonal. It rotates the atlas. Obliquus capitis, superior, assists with rectus capitis, in lateral flexion of the head, and that's going to be because of its position. Um, you know, laterally, it's not very medial. Rectus capitis posterior major rotates the head to the ipsilateral side. Ipsilateral means to the same side. So to the same side that rectus capitis posterior is on, when it contracts unilaterally, it rotates the head to that same side. Contralateral means opposite side, and that's what semispinalis does. It rotates to the contralateral side. And then we have the upper trapezius, which is going to be the most prominent muscle in this region. It extends the head and rotates it to the ipsilateral side. All right, so here are pictures of most of these. Rectus capitis posterior major right here, and then minor right here running down this way. Obliquus capitis superior and inferior. Here's inferior running obliquely. And here's superior, and it's, it's deep. Underneath there. And remember, those rotate the head to the ipsilateral side. So you can imagine when those fibers um, contract and shorten, they're going to pull, they're going to yank on that nuchal line up here and pull your head around to rotate it that way. Here is splenius capitis. Underneath that, semispinalis capitis. Okay, so splenius capitis and sternocleidomastoid, these are larger muscles and they are more powerful in moving the cervical head and spine. So let's take a look at them. Here is sternocleidomastoid. Not only is it a mouthful, its name is actually very descriptive. Um, it originates on the sternum and the clavicle, in the midpoint between those two, as well as up here on the mastoid process, hence the name sternocleido from um, clavicle and then mastoid. Um, but notice how it, it's at this kind of oblique angle to the cervical spine, which is interesting because when both sides of it contract, you get extension of the head, right? So it's gonna actually pull the head into extension.
but flexion of the neck. So it's going to pull the neck into flexion. Sorry, that was not a good arrow. Flexion of the neck. And it's because of that oblique angle. Now, if one side contracts, so we have bilateral, sorry, unilateral contraction, we get rotation to, so if just the right side contracts, um, rotation to the left and lateral flexion to the right. So if this shortens, it's going to pull the head around that way. Or if, you, if it's going to do lateral flexion, it's going to pull this mastoid process down to the shoulder. The splenius muscles, both cervices and capitis, we saw these in a different picture as well. When both sides contract, so bilateral contraction, we get extension of the head and neck. So unlike sternocleidomastoid, they extend the head and the neck at the same time, whereas sternocleidomastoid, when it contracts, you get um, extension of the head, but flexion of the neck, cervical flexion. We also get, uh, when they contract unilaterally, we get rotation and lateral flexion to the ipsilateral side, so to the same side. Okay, muscles of the vertebral column. What we just looked at were muscles that move the head and also maybe the cervical region, but now we're just gonna look at muscles that are only in the vertebral column. So first we have the longest collie muscles on the anterior aspect, and these flex the cervical and upper thoracic vertebrae. You can see how they're running down here along the bodies of the vertebrae from vertebra to vertebra. Posteriorly, you have these um, all of these intrinsic muscles. You have the multifidus muscles, which are running from the spinous process down to the transverse process um, of the vertebrae a couple lower. You have these intertransversari, which are going from transverse to transverse process. Rotatories in here. You don't have to know all of these. You just have to know multifidus. And all of these small intrinsic muscles stabilize each of the individual intervertebral joints. Now some of the larger musculature, posteriorly we have the serratus posterior, and it has both a superior and an inferior region. So here's the superior, and down here is the inferior. And you can see how this runs off of the spinous process and then onto the ribs. Here and here, and it's called serratus because it has this sort of serrated appearance. If someone's very lean and you can see their serratus posterior or serratus anterior, it looks like the edge of, an, of a serrated knife. And we also have semispinalis thoracis. So semispinalis is also coming off of the spinous processes of the vertebrae and attaching on the ribs, but more medially. All right, so we also have the interspinal intertransverse uh, group, and these muscles flex for uh, the vertebral column laterally, and they connect to transverse processes of adjacent vertebrae. So here is the intertransversari group running down between the spinous processes of those lumbar vertebrae. Now the muscles of the thorax, a lot, uh, these muscles are involved in breathing. The first is the diaphragm. It's responsible for breathing during quiet rest. So most of you listening right now, unless you're listening to this while you exercise on the Stairmaster or something, most of you are at quiet rest currently. And so your diaphragm is the only muscle that is active in your respiration. As it contracts and flattens, it expands the thoracic volume to suck air into your lungs. But when larger amounts of air are needed, like when you're exercising, other thoracic muscles have a more significant role. So some of those muscles, we have the scalenes, these elevate the first two ribs. You can see them here. Sternocleidomastoid is here above, recall, right here. We have the external intercostals, which also expand the chest. Those are going to be here. Levator costarum and serratus posterior um, superior. These, and then the in, so, the, so these first ones that I just mentioned are all for inspiration. And then the internal intercostals, transversus thoracis, serratus posterior inferior, and subcostals, these all aid in forced expiration. So this is when you're blowing air out really hard. And if you want, go ahead right now and take a deep, fast breath in, and then hold it, and then blow out as hard as you can. And you've just activated all of those muscles. Now your erector spinae muscles, 
this is one of the larger, and as, so it's easier to palpate, but also more complex muscle groups. And you can see in this picture that it's not exactly one muscle, it's really a group of muscles. Okay, so we have, we have layers and levels of this. So we have the spinalis layer, which is the most medial. So here is the spinalis layer, right? And it's these um, running along the spinous processes of these vertebrae. It's the most medial spinalis spinous process. Um, we have the longis longissimus layer. This is the middle layer. And these are running just lateral to spinalis. And then we have the iliocostalis layer, which goes from the iliac crest to the ribs, ilium iliocostalis. Okay, and then I mentioned that they have regions so we have the thoracic region, cervical region. There's also the capitis region, lumbar region. So depending on which layer and which region you're talking about, you might say, you know, the longissimus thoracis because it's the longissimus layer in the thoracic region. Or you might say the um, iliocostalis thoracis. This would be longissimus thoracis. Or you could have spine, um, you know, the lumbar spinalis. And the actions that these muscles do, um, extension of the spine, right? So if they contract bilaterally, you can imagine if we have all of these muscles contracting, even though they don't directly cross these joints, but if they contract bilaterally, they're gonna pull the spine into extension. But if one side contracts, then it's lateral flexion to the ipsilateral side, to that same side, um, as well as ipsilateral rotation. Now, I mentioned before that this pelvic girdle, let's draw both sides, um, it moves as a unit when you have movement at the lumbar spine and movement at the hip. So this musculature, especially iliocostalis, because it's you know, coming up off of the iliac crest, but also um, spinalis as well, because it's coming up off the sacrum too, they can assist in anterior pelvic rotation. Now the quadratus lumborum, this is an interesting muscle because it's arising off of the iliac crest, going up to the transverse processes of your lumbar vertebrae, and then also onto the 12th rib. So it, it has a, a lot of roles. It stabilizes the pelvis and lumbar spine. So if you've ever sat crookedly for a long time or laid on your side, with your legs curled up, especially if you're, do, if you're doing that for a long period of time, <clears throat> you may have um, allowed one of your quadratus lumborum to become tight um, and shortened after sitting there for a prolonged period of time. Um, and what that does is that could lead you to having some sort of a hip hike where you know, maybe, maybe this side is a little higher than the other because these, of these shortened fibers. Maybe these fibers are shortened on this side, which is going to you know, cause your femur on the side to be higher. I'm not gonna draw a very good femur. There's a femur. Um, you know, maybe this femur is a little bit higher, maybe just by an inch, but that's gonna throw up your gait, okay? Oftentimes low back pain can stem from a quadratus lumborum that's um, overactive and overtight or underactive and tight. But not only does it stabilize the pelvis and lumbar spine, it also um, laterally flexes to the ipsilateral side. Um, Bilaterally, it extends the lumbar spine and does anterior pelvic rotation. And then it can also um, do lateral pelvic rotation to the contralateral side. So what I mean by that is if, let's say that, uh, that these fibers on this left side, because this is an anterior view, let's say that they contract. And what that's going to do is hike this hip up even higher. And so the line of the hips is gonna go from here to here, okay? And that's lateral pelvic rotation to this side. If we imagine the pelvis like a cup or a bucket full of water, the direction it rotates is the direction that that water spills. So if you rotate it this way, the water is going to spill out of it to the opposite side of the muscles that contracted. Okay, so that's lateral pelvic rotation to the contralateral side. Now the muscles of the abdominal wall, I mentioned that the rectus abdominis, right here, this is the muscle that most people care about when they talk about core training. You know, you get the six pack, or if you're lean enough to get the eight pack with these lower abdominals in here. But, and it's important, but there are other important 
uh, muscles as well. We have the external and the internal obliques. Now the external obliques, the fibers, are running downwards. They're oblique fibers. So if you, if you want to put your hands in your, let's say you had a sweatshirt, like a hoodie sweatshirt with a pocket in the front, and you go to put your hands in that pocket, um, the angle of your fingers as you put your hands downward and forward into that front kind of pouch pocket um, on either side, that's going to be the same angle as the fibers of your external oblique. And then your internal oblique runs the opposite way. It kind of runs this way. And then your transverse abdominis is underneath those. It's deep to those and it's running transverse. And we're gonna take a look at all four of these. Here you can see this cutaway, external oblique, internal oblique, transversus abdominis, and rectus abdominis. All right, so rectus abdominis, this is obviously going to do lumbar flexion, right? Because this is when we do, uh, you know, there used to be this thing some of my friends did in um, middle, middle school, I don't know. I don't know why, but they did a thousand sit-ups a day, I think because they thought they were going to get totally ripped six packs. Unfortunately, it doesn't quite work that way. Okay, the external abdominal oblique. Now, when both sides contract, we get lumbar flexion along with the rectus abdominis um, and posterior pelvic rotation. All right, so lumbar flexion can be that way. Moving into flexion. But when we have just one side contracting, so unilateral contraction, let's, let's say that we're talking about the right side. If the right side contracts, and we have to imagine that these fibers that are running antero-inferiorly, they're shortening. Okay, so they're moving these two points closer together. What that will lead to, if the right side contracts, we will get lumbar lateral flexion to the right. So like a side bend to the right side, you're dropping your right shoulder down. But we don't rotate to that side, we would rotate to the left because it's pulling a more posterior point towards the anterior point of the muscle. And so this point is going to move around in rotation. So if the right side contracts, we get lateral flexion to the right and rotation to the left. Okay, so the external obliques, when they contract bilaterally, you get lumbar flexion and posterior pelvic rotation. When they contract unilaterally, you get ipsilateral lateral flexion and contralateral rotation. The internal obliques um, are a little bit different. Now they still do lumbar flexion and posterior pelvic rotation, but when they contract unilaterally, you, get, you still get ipsilateral lateral flexion, but then you also get ipsilateral rotation. All right, so let's imagine that these fibers are contracting, and that's going to bring you into lateral flexion to that same side. So your shoulder is going to be dropped from there to there, you know, and you're gonna do a side bend. I can't really draw it in 3D. You're side bending to the right, um, <clears throat> ipsilateral lateral rotation. But let's say, let's now imagine these fibers contracting, and they're going to bring these points further this way. And so that's going to rotate you around and so now your shoulders, which were here, are going to rotate around this axis, right? And it's going to rotate your, it's really the rotation is occurring down here at your lumbar spine. But it's, it's a lateral flexion and rotation to the ipsilateral side. Transverse abdominis, um, this actually doesn't move your spine at all. What it does is it helps you enforce expiration. So when these flatten and contract, it pushes that air back out of your lungs fast. Okay, so we have successfully made it through all of the musculature in the trunk and spinal column. Uh, what I would recommend is, as you study these muscles, palpate them on yourself, go through the movements, so, so do the movements um, using your own body and feel those muscles contracting. You wanna feel it first on your own body and then you know go find um, a study partner or someone that you're living with uh, that you know well, ask their permission, and then practice finding these muscles on them as well. Um, that's going to help you uh, beyond just reading the textbook and looking at these pictures. It's going to help you immensely as you study to really ingrain these muscles and get them into your, your learned sort of kinesthetic memory. Okay, thanks so much for watching and we'll see you guys next time.